Hello, theology nerds. This is Trip, and today on the podcast, returning is Paul Capitz. He is a United Methodist minister. He is a PhD in historical theology, and he recently released a book looking at the Reformation, the way it relates to Scripture, and these different trajectories of the role of Scripture, gospel, historical criticism, and such uh, from Luther and Calvin, early Reformation on through like Bart, Boltmann and such. And we talk about it. We talk about it right here. I absolutely love the book. It's compelling. It's easy to follow and read the narrative and, and the uh, theological center of it is right on the tip of the page. Plus, it's not super long. Like it doesn't get distracted. It makes the point about Protestantism's need to recommit and re-engage the radical Reformation principle of Luther. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm down. Down to hang out with Paul again. Paul, thank you. Always good to connect with you. And all you listeners, thank you so much for listening, sharing, supporting the podcast. Uh, If you want to join the community, head over to homebrewedcommunity.com and make it happen. Hello, everyone. Uh, This is Trip and returning to the podcast is Paul Caputz, and we're going to have some fun talking about really like how to be a good Protestant, a good liberal Protestant. Uh, why, if you take the gospel seriously, you reorient your relationship to scripture on behalf of the gospel and uh, a whole bunch of other goodies that Paul wrote briefly, concisely, and compellingly in his new book. So uh, one, I well, it's great to see you again. And uh, I absolutely Thanks. love the book. I'm I'm really glad you read it and, and asked to speak with me, Trip. That's that's great. So I, I'm interested in the, the the way you frame the challenge around tradition, authority, scripture for Protestantism in the present. Uh, as we as as more and more of the church becomes aware of the questions and criticisms modernity raised to Christianity, as they become more kind of ubiquitous and even in the life and uh, and the kind of intellectual questions that lay people have. One of the gifts of the book uh, is to go, uh, the kind of questions we're asking are at the very foundation of Protestantism. And a, a debate uh, that starts with Calvin and Luther uh, actually models different trajectories that Protestantism can develop. And in light of all the challenges of modernity, the wisdom of Luther and the prioritization of the gospel uh, is something uh, that we can do that's deeply Christian, deeply Protestant, and uh, makes the our own understanding of the gospel deeply grounded in our own context, questions, anxieties, and challenges. And I just think uh, if people are considering buying the book, all that is things I loved about it. So when you think of the origin story of this book, like as a historical theologian, what was the on-the-ground context where uh, this kind of historical telling or a genealogy of Protestantisms in Scripture uh, was uh, the creative output uh, that you, you saw on the horizon. As I begin the first chapter of the book, I talk about my own experience growing up in the church and meeting a minister at summer camp when I was 13 years old who asked me if I would consider becoming a minister. And I told him that, no, I couldn't become a minister because I didn't believe everything in the Bible. And rather than being shocked and horrified and, and lecturing me on the need to believe everything in the Bible, he took my theological question seriously and said some things to me that really provoked me into much deeper reflection on the Bible than I had ever engaged in before. And I was very impressed with how sharp this guy was intellectually. I don't think I had ever met a minister or a Christian who could. He was a Claremont graduate, by the way, and and he, uh, your alma mater. And and basically he, he let me understand that it, it was possible to take the Bible with utter seriousness without having to sacrifice my reason and intellect or conscience as a condition of, of being a Christian. I mean, the, the, the example I give of why I I didn't believe everything in the Bible at 13 years old was because my dad had taken me to the 
Museum of Natural History downtown LA, where I had seen uh, the remains of dinosaurs. And I remember asking one of my Sunday school teachers when we were studying the creation story in the book of Genesis, where do the dis- dinosaurs fit into this story? And yeah. she couldn't answer the question. And I knew something was amiss. And, you know, very soon I began, by the time I was 13, I already realized at some level that you had to make a choice between what the Bible said about the creation of the world and, and what science said about it. And, you know, before becoming an adult, there, there was already the issue of women's ordination. And I, I mentioned an, an example, my mother had been very excited when the first woman was ordained in our annual conference of the United Methodist Church, which I think must have been in the late sixties or early seventies. And cousin of mine, who was a fundamentalist Baptist minister was visiting us from out of state and he upbraided my mother for thinking this was a good thing when, when the Bible obviously was opposed to the ordination of women. And, you know, so already as, as a young kid, before ever going to college, I, I was aware that there were some major problems with the way the Bible was usually approached, that it was to be taken as a whole or not at all. But in that case, you had obvious conflicts with modern science, as well as what I would call modern ethical sensibilities about, in this case, the equality of women with men. And then, you know, that was just opening Pandora's box because as you know, we, we later faced the issue of homosexuality, uh, an issue that, that I had to deal with personally in in the the 1980s when I went to Yale divinity school. And I was very shocked when I went to Yale Divinity School to meet professors and students who, though they were not fundamentalists, nonetheless appealed to biblical authority as though it were somehow a self-evident authority that you could not call into question if you were going to be a Christian. And I, I mean, none of these people believed that the creation story was historically true or were opposed to the ordination of women. So I, I, I couldn't quite understand how they would act the way fundamentalists would act when they didn't believe what fundamentalists believed about the Bible. Mm. And, and, you know, throughout my career, I, I've just been struck by these knee jerk reactions on the part of Christians who basically I think have made an idol out of the Bible. And so, so when I, when I, when I was at Yale Divinity School, but the most important course I had was a course taught by a New Testament professor who was also Vermont, David Lull, and it was on the theology of Rudolf Bultmann. And, uh, that, that went against the grain of Yale Divinity School since Yale was committed to bards, uh, above all. In that seminar with Bultmann, I learned probably how to think in a sophisticated theological manner about the Bible for the first time. And, and Boltmann, as you know, advocated what is called Sachkritik in German, uh, content criticism, criticizing what the Bible says on the basis of what the Bible means. And this is an idea that was first proposed by Karl Barth, who later backtracked from accepting the full implications of that idea, at least in Boltmann's interpretation of Barth. And then through Boltmann, I discovered that Luther already in the 16th century had, had engaged in similar criticism Bible. The issue basically for Luther is that when we're reading the new Testament, we come to an understanding of what the gospel message is. And then in the light of that understanding of the gospel message, we can return to scripture and criticize portions of scripture that seem inadequate when measured by the gospel to which scripture itself bears witness. So that another way of speaking of content criticism or Zach critique is to speak of it as imminent criticism. You're not bringing an external standard to bear and using that as the measuring rod for criticizing the Bible. You're, you're using the Bible's own intrinsic standard and, and using that as the means of, of measuring 
adequacy of this, that, or the other passage in the Bible. Right. And, and, and I mean, Luther is the first Protestant. So what, what strikes me as so strange is how few Protestants even know about this aspect of their Protestant heritage. And many of the, I mean, the only people who really know about this sort of thing is, as far as I'm aware of are, are, are theologians and biblical scholars. And, and the vast majority of them think this is where Luther went wrong. I mean, so, so I, I don't quite understand how people who are, are trained in historical critical method of the Bible and, you know, in effect, treat the Bible as a, as a human document, which is what it means to apply historical critical method to it, can then act, you know, when it comes to theological and ethical questions as though it, it's really not a human book. It's, it's a supernaturally revealed document. And, and so, you know, for 40 years since I graduated from Yale Divinity School, I, I think that Protestantism has been speaking out of both sides of its mouth. And, you know, I, oh, I, yeah. I, I felt that, that somebody needed to rescue the Bible, uh, from this self-contradiction because the people who are, are the most vocal representatives of Bible in our culture are, are, are the fundamentalists and the evangelicals who distort it. Mm -hmm. and distort the gospel message. So that that's, that's what's bugged me. No, no, no. I, I, yeah, I completely get that. And I think you're, I think you're right that that so often the performance of more mainline or liberal Protestant uh, denominations and clergy and such, uh, it performs their kind of gospel filtering of the text with the mode of argument and presentation and authority claiming that much more conservative Protestants do, uh, that uh, the invitation uh, to receive Scripture as something that comes out of an encounter with the gospel rather than the gospel itself uh, or the, um, the, the, that, that that dynamic sits there. So you, you know, regularly will, our denominations will put a biblical footnote on top of what is a contested ethical claim in scripture and then pretend that sola scriptura says, you know, neither male nor female and that right. kind of thing. That's well said. A scripture arises out of an encounter with the gospel. Mm -hmm. that the gospel is not the scripture. The scripture is not the gospel. And that's, that's one of those uh, elements in the, in the historical narrative that you, that, that you raise that I think like an, uh, not being familiar with church history and the birth of Protestantism, uh, so often we just receive this Protestant scriptures w with a kind of uh, kind of assumption uh, around how it functions authoritatively. Uh, but in the text, when you're talking, uh, when you're like inviting us to think as to what occasioned Luther's resistance, like part of it was uh, the scripture and his encounter with the gospel in the scripture, cr critiquing the authority and teachings of the church, and that that what is the place that the individual before God. Uh, um, is able to resist, uh, critique, and challenge the authority of the received tradition and of the church. And for him, you know, it 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 comes uh, from his reading the scripture without the weight of the whole tradition uh, filtering right. his interpretation. That's that's very well said. How how do you think this these Lutheran ideas would play in your own Baptist uh, in the churches? I mean, you're you're you were raised as a Baptist. I was raised as a Methodist. You, we what? Baptists, I think, have a natural, uh, like a more Christocentric piety than a lot of other mainliners. I mean, the phrase like "no creed but Christ" comes out. Uh, we have a, a lot more Jesus hymns, like "What a friend we have in Jesus." Like a lot of our piety is very Jesus centric, so there's some kind of tendency to prioritize a Jesus gospel centered engagement. Uh, I don't think it's like conscious in any way, but if you just occupy this form of thinking, uh, people will often resonate with it. Uh, the, the the interesting thing to me has been the increasing rehabilitation of the tradition as authority, even in free church traditions, where uh, but the Southern Baptists are considering the creed again. Um, I mean, they started using it again after – 
uh, the takeover, like and reference points to kind of boundary markers, right? But um, un- underneath it, I think there's a the Christocentrism of Baptist piety uh, makes it different than uh, a lot of more mainline traditions are more theocentric in piety and and in the language it shows up in prayers and worship and and they're way more likely to have to read elements from the tradition out right like prayers or the creeds these kinds of things um exist in worship and when we don't talk about how we receive them or how we vocalize them they can end up bearing the weight of tradition in a in a more kind of top-down way when i asked you that question about the baptist i mean you were raised as a southern baptist right uh, it started out that way. We got excommunicated. You, oh, oh, your church did your congregation. Yeah, my, my parents were church planters. So uh, okay. de- the takeover yeah, I, at the national level happens and then it plays out at state levels. And then, okay. Okay. Uh, then they show up to give your church plant so, so, a baptismal so award and there's gay your, worship. Your, 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 your family, you and your family are more like Jimmy Carter who left the Southern Baptist convention as a result of the, of the fundamentalist takeover. Yeah, and I, yeah. yeah, I always say that we're the Jimmy Carter, Walter Rauschenbusch, Martin Luther King Jr. style of Baptist. Oh, I like that kind. Yeah. 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 So it's the, well, okay. So, so I, but I, but my, my question was, I mean, just think of, of fundamentalism that's represented by, you know, the Southern Baptists are the second largest, the largest Protestant denomination in America and the second largest Christian, second only to the Roman Catholic, right? So, so. My argument is diametrically opposed to the kind of approach to the Bible illustrated by the fundamentalism. I'm not saying that is the authentic Baptist heritage, but I'm saying that's the the factual stance of the largest Baptist denomination, which happens to be the largest Protestant denomination. So Protestantism, uh, their views on the Bible are far more representative of the majority of Protestants in America than my view, right? And yet I think I've got the first Protestant on my, I, I know I do, on my side, right? And and his best disciple in the 20th century in this regard uh, was Rudolf Bultmann, who was almost universally lambasted as some kind of heretic and apostate from the true Christian faith because of his uh, critical approach to the Bible, not only critical historical, but critical theological. Mm -hmm. So I'm essentially trying to reclaim this, what I think is the authentic Protestant heritage from its usurpers, uh, which include all those on, on the religious right, but not only on the far right, there's plenty in the center of mainline Protestantism who are different only as a matter of degree from right. where, so, so this is interesting in the first chapter, when I, when I, the person I go after in the contemporary debate about homosexuality is Richard Hayes, who was one of my teachers at Yale Divinity School. And then he went on to become a, a teacher at, at Duke and he spent his whole career opposing the equality of gay and lesbian people in the church. Mm -hmm. And now after the book was published, I was told that Richard Hayes has changed his mind. Or as I've heard it said, uh, Richard Hayes believes that God has changed his mind, (laughs) which is apparently what allows Richard Hayes to change it. You know, I mean, uh, Hayes was a vociferous critic of Wolfman when I was at seminary at Yale. And, uh, and yet how do you change your mind on homosexuality without adopting something like what Oldman called awkwardy, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. mean, I'm happy, I'm happy he's changed his mind and I'm interested in, uh, seeing what the reasons are when the new book comes out that he wrote with his son at Fuller Seminary, but it's taken him four years to, to get to a position that, you know, I mean. I, I think that you're either a fundamentalist or you're you're on my side. I think these wishy-washy people in between are just, I mean, they're they're speaking out of both sides of their mouths, and it, it's an internally unstable uh, position. I'd love for you to kind of set that, uh, develop that contrast you draw in the book between Luther and Calvin, uh, 
um, and how they saw scripture functioning theologically, uh, because that trajectory, I think it is really helpful because, uh, yeah, okay. There's one expression that people might think of in like that anti-modernist fundamentalist style. Uh, but that distinction is one that still exists broadly in Protestantism and, uh, the, that different trajectory, I think, is really helpful at uh, isolating uh, the unique energy of of kind of a Protestant. Yeah, I mean, Cal- Calvin has been far more influential on English speaking Protestantism than Luther has, for obvious historical reasons. Many of the people who shaped English Protestantism in the 16th century have been refugees uh, from England and and uh, during the reign of, of Queen Mary, Henry VIII's Catholic daughter, who sought to undo what her father had done in severing the Church of England from papacy. And these people had fled to Geneva and, and uh, waited out her reign, you know, admiring what Calvin had accomplished in Geneva. So that became the norm for them of what they took a truly reformed church and society to look like. And w- when they came back, these are the people we, we know as Puritans who were, were disappointed with Queen Elizabeth, Mary's half-sister, with what they considered to be her compromise uh, when Catholic and Protestant element, the so-called middle way of, of Anglicanism. And this approach to the Bible differs from Luther's approach in that For Luther, it's the message of justification by faith alone, which is for Luther, the gospel, serves as the criterion for doctrine as well as church practice. It didn't really matter to Luther that everything in his contemporary church had to conform to the way things were in the Church of New Testament times, so long as nothing in his church doctrinally or in terms of religious practice was in contradiction to the main doctrine of justification. But with the reformed Calvin and Stingley, uh, you you have a very different attitude. And and that is that it's not just the main doctrine. It's everything else scripture says that has to be followed. And, And in, you know, Karl Barth really does follow Luther. I mean, apologies, he follows Calvin and, and Spingley uh, in this regard. And when I cite him in these passages uh, in the book where he, he says, Luther, Luther developed the doctrine of justification with far greater profundity than, than either of those other two guys, Calvin and, and Spingley did. But for them, unlike for Luther, it was the retrieval of scriptural authority as a whole that that was the centerpiece of their reformation and you know for all of his indebtedness to to luther calvin could not bring himself to criticize any parts of scripture as for instance luther uh, criticized the epistle of james that's not the only Mm -hmm. part of scripture he criticized but that was the the most famous illustration of that and, and, you know, Luther made some very disparaging remarks about James and said it should never have been put into the canon uh, of the New Testament. And Calvin has to bend over backwards to find some way to reconcile James with Paul. And, and, and what he does basically is he tries to redefine what James means by the words faith and justify so as to bring James into harmony with Paul. So could, and, could you say a bit about the contrast that Luther was, like the criticism Luther uh, vocalized about his yeah, criticism well, of James? Well, uh, Luther identified Paul as the clearest theological voice in the New Testament. And Paul, Paul's gospel, according to Luther, was, was that we are justified by faith alone without works of the law. And, and James says that we are not justified by faith alone, but by faith and works. So, I mean, I mean, Luther sees a contradiction between these two statements. And 
he, he cannot har harmonize them. And, and Calvin attempts to do precisely that, to bring them into harmony so yeah. that you don't have to choose. And, 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 that, and that's what most Christians have done throughout the centuries, is they, they can't bring themselves to criticize anything in, in the Bible because the assumption is, well, since the Bible is inspired by God or the Holy Spirit, if you criticize the Bible, you're not just criticizing some human author, you're criticizing God. And, and who of us can criticize God? I mean, if, if you believe for whatever reason that the entire Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation, it is supernaturally inspired uh, and, and that therefore everything in it is true beyond question, you may have a a coherent systematic point of view, but I, it, it's not one that I can share. If that, if, if being a Christian means that I have to believe that, then I already knew when I was 13 years old, I couldn't believe that. Yeah. There's a lot of ambiguity in Luther's writings because, you know, initially you get the impression that he's elevating the canon of scripture as divinely, as God's divinely inspired word and using that to critique the merely human post-biblical tradition of the Catholic church. I mean, that's what we, you know, that, that's what it means to say sola scriptura, scripture alone and not scripture and the tradition of the church are the norms of doctrine and practice. Uh, but then you, 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 you stumble when you see that Luther is willing to criticize parts of scripture in the name of what he takes the main point of scripture to be, the gospel. Then you have to say, wait a minute, there's something more going on in Luther that than first met the eye here, right? Luther was not only willing to, to criticize the script, the tradition in the name of scripture, but he was also willing to criticize scripture in the name of the gospel, which he found in scripture. And that's that content criticism saying that the gospel comes prior, uh, to right. scripture. Well, and, and as a historical fact, nobody would doubt that if, if what you mean by that is that before there were any written documents that found their way into the New Testament, there was oral speech. Somebody said, Jesus saved me and he can save you too if you believe in him. You see what I mean? Uh, yeah. And so Luther's always emphasizing that the gospel is primarily an oral word, not a written word. Yeah, and that's and, that's right. Like that even resonates with his reading, uh, his kind of the way he's tending to Paul when you get like, Faith comes by hearing. Exactly. Um, and, and even when you see in Paul the little bits we get of kind of Christianity prior to him showing up are, right. are, are statements about the event of the cross and resurrection, the enactment of the Eucharist, uh, right. shared prayers, the kind of liturgical hosting of the Christ event is what, right. what Paul's building on. It's not even uh, a, 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 it's a set kind of confession of an encounter, not uh, a set of doctrine. And I think that uh, one of the freedoms of Protestantism, that Protestantism in and of itself has been a bit allergic to, um, is, is really the genuine freedom of letting the gospel become the measure of all of our attempts to enact the presence of Christ and articulate the good news uh, in the present. Exactly. And, and that's why I say, uh, picking up on a phrase from Richard Hayes, who calls for a scripture shaped church, uh, I suggest in, instead we have a gospel shaped church. I don't mean by that, that we're not immersed in scripture, but I mean, scripture per se is the norm. It's the gospel. Uh, that we find in scripture. And uh, that, that's, that's the difference between being a Lutheran, in, at least in this respect and, and being a Calvinist. How do you see that kind of playing out as we get more distance? Because even Luther's own criticism towards the text in canon, both James, but also the way, uh, criticism towards reading it on behalf of, or, uh, scripture as servant to the gospel, that kind of energy kind of uh, dissipates when Protestants come to have their own canon, and then it functions as the same kind of referential authority uh, 
that the tradition functioned for uh, in the church that Luther's criticizing, right? And right. and to Luther, it's a live question because the moment the gospel justifies a protest against the tradition, he's not dumb enough to forget the tradition decided what was in canon. And the tradition came up with the creeds to tell you how to read the canon. And the tradition has elevated particular patterns and habits of interpretation of how to read the canon. And the tradition has told us when you read this text, you should read this text slightly edited together. The kind of energy in your description of Luther versus Calvin to me is uh, is one where their their kind of natural posture uh, towards the liveliness of uh, the gospel is different, right? Like in some sense, for Luther, the the initial Protestant insight is kind of like if the the mountain of tradition we discover, oh, you know, this actually used to be a volcano. And it's just kind of hardened and is stuck here. And he's poking around, reading some Paul, and a crack in the crust goes, and then there's lava there. And he goes, this is where the mountain came from. It's a volcano. It's a lava. Right. Yeah. That's what built this thing. Let's, give, let's do more of this. And so yeah. then you poke and critique the tradition, not to tear it up, actually to open it up to the very kind of like molten energy that creates something new. Uh, and it creates it new in that place, in that context, all over again. It, when, when you see how Calvin's relating to it, it's kind of like he's like, no, we, we got to figure out what the correct mountain is. We got to have the right, the right structure, the right institution. We got to organize the authority and, and, and set up an institution, maybe even a whole town. Definitely don't want uh, sketchy people around the Trinity running around because they burn well. And this kind of thing. And when you think of the, even that kind of dynamic, it's like, what is it? calls the deep trust of faith out of you. For Luther, it, it was him genuinely trusting what God has said about us in Christ is true, and he can't turn it off, call it fake, or mute it. That right. the one who made you and knows you completely has called you God's own beloved, and it's above your pay grade, no matter how filthy of a sinner you think you are, um, oh, to tell God right. you're wrong about the value of the one you made, right? Like, and that molten energy there he's like this is what we're holding on to like this is what we're tending to and it's not something that gets tamed and so it's prior and everything else comes after and that's a very different kind of energy uh than you get uh, in in the reformed side of protestantism well let me say a couple of things what is that luther is a mixed bag between medieval elements mm -hmm. and modern elements and and this is why you know, when you're reading Luther, you have to try to disentangle what are the aspects of medievalism that he simply assumed as a matter of course, being a 16th century man. And, and what are his genuine insights that break with medievalism, even if he himself doesn't fully understand the logical consequences of his own old insights? Yeah. And I cite an author in this chapter, Paul Lehman, who, who uh, said the great tragedy of the Reformation is that Luther's followers have seized on the element of his thought, which were medieval, and, and, and tossed aside the really creative insight that he himself came up with. So Lutheranism oddly enough, now has its own tradition of orthodoxy through which they read the New Testament, and it's called the Book of Concord, which contains their confessional statements from the 16th and 17th century. When I taught in Minnesota, you know, virtually right next door to the biggest Lutheran seminary in the country, I was just struck by how students and professors were cracked, if you will, by what these Lutheran confessions had to say, and and they were essentially repeating uh, the same error that Luther had detected in medieval Catholicism. You can't let the gospel break through. You you can't let the volcano erupt because you're you're doing everything you can to to cover up the uh, hole that the lava gets through. 
Huge yeah, damage, right? it, 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 that's similar to kind of Luther's critique of American Protestantism. I mean, not Luther's, uh, Paul Tillich's critique yeah. of American Protestantism. He comes to America and it's like Protestantism without a Reformation. It's that was Bon, not Tillich, Bonhoeffer. Yeah, Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer said Protestantism right, without right. a Reformation. And Tillich, in Courage to Be, is like, well, what happened to the Protestant principle? Like, we're now, I, we're, we've ossalized the gospel to tend to a medieval anxiety and not addressing the crisis of modernity. I think that was my big discovery when I studied in Germany. I found in the German theological tradition a radical dynamism that I had never encountered in American Protestantism. And, and so many of the great modern theologians who have influenced me, Boltmann, Tillich, uh, Reinhold Mabor, Gerhard Abeling, uh, they have been Lutherans and, and I was influenced by them before I was actually influenced by reading Luther himself. And even though we American product, I mean, I was raised a Methodist. I, I also served in the Presbyterian church, uh, you know, Presbyterians and Methodists, you know, both acknowledge Luther as in some sense, our Protestant founder, but, uh, I you know, never encountered anything like the radicality towards the Bible or even never even really heard the freeing, liberating message of the gospel in a way that I encounter in these Lutheran theologians and then in Luther himself when I was growing up in the Methodist church. So, you know, and, and to be honest, this meth, this minister at summer camp, when I was 13 years old was, was basically introducing me to a Lutheran idea about the Bible, even though he may not have been aware of it. You know, I mean, he didn't mention Luther. He, he might've been aware of it. My point is that, you know, in saying you, you can be critical of Bible and still be a Christian because you believe in, in the gospel fundamental message of church about Jesus. I mean, it, you know, that, that, that's a Lutheran idea, right? Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that you did in the book is take this kind of uh, the, the contrast between Luther and Calvin, and then put it into modernity where we're Luther in some sense, is like the patron saint of liberal Protestantism, because in modernity, we get introduced to all the kind of historical critical methods. Uh, where you have a growing uh, awareness of the the tension between receiving the biblical text as if uh, it, they're speaking in the same register as uh, natural science or this kind of thing. Um, there's a growing, a growing kind of non-competitive and genuinely uh, kind of open relationship to other religious traditions, especially in in the 20th century. Uh, kind of thinking back through our relationship uh, to the the Jewish people. And such, and then there's the uh, the the kind of Bible wars that the modern modernity's desire to have an authority in all the places that that Christians get increasingly uneasy culturally uh, because they're no longer culture dominant. That then, it, right, this the the scripture becomes like some external authority to lean on and and make reference to, and it's easier to abstract authority out of a text rather than to trust the authority of an encounter with the gospel. Right. And so the, right. uh, the, uh, I'd love for you to kind of like take us into the relationship of Bart and Boltmann of kind of, uh, what was going on that helped them, uh, see themselves as, as, uh, as allies that they have some kind of like shared response to this moment. And then how the different trajectories uh, sure. kind of developed a contrast that you, that you lay out. Well, let me just start by saying that I, I do believe that liberal Protestantism, by which I mean that the tradition that began in the 19th century with Schleiermacher is the authentic heir in the modern world of the Reformation heritage. And, and, and I became convinced of that when, after, uh, studying at Yale, uh, I, I went to the university of Chicago for my PhD and I came under the spell of a British scholar named Brian Garish, who was a student of Wilhelm Pauk, and Pauk was a student of Trelgen Harnack, 
And Garish's whole scholarly agenda was to demonstrate the, the lines of continuity between the classical Reformation heritage of, of the Reformation with uh, 19th century liberal Protestant theology. And, and that, that's a completely antithetical way of, of understanding the relationship between the Reformation and liberal Protestant theology than I was taught at Yale, uh, where liberal theology is the betrayal of, of the Reformation. When you talk about, about it's, that was the, the line that Bart argued for, that, that with Schleiermacher and the liberals, the line of continuity, the reformers, Luther and Calvin, was broken. So, so Bart repudiated liberal Protestantism and tried to overcome it without becoming a fundamentalist or whatever. Bultmann, although he's often seen as a liberal, Bultmann would never call himself a liberal. Bultmann acknowledged that, like Bart, he too had been educated in the liberal Protestant tradition by all these great liberal Protestant scholars. But um, like Bards, Bultmann, who initially saw himself as one of Bard's followers, engaged in this deep criticism of the, the inherited 19th century liberal tradition and was concerned, like Bard, to recover um, a theological approach to the interpretation of scripture, which was something more than a mere historical understanding of it in its ancient context, which is what Boltmann identified as uh, a liberal approach. Now, Boltmann never ceased to be a liberal in that sense, namely that he sought to understand as carefully as possible the meaning of the New Testament text in relation to their ancient context. His primary concern was doing what he saw the earth bark calling for, uh, namely that you have something to say when you stand up in the pulpit on Sunday morning and you're, you're preaching on a text from, uh, the Bible. And, and so, you know, it, I mean, that may seem a, a subtle distinction, uh, because Boltman obviously has more in common with his liberal, uh, teachers than, that. Bart did finally, but nonetheless, uh, Boltmann would reject this common, uh, description of him that I see so often that he's a liberal, but nonetheless, I, I think the fundamental difference as they themselves came to realize was, was how liberal they were or not, but that Boltmann was a Lutheran and, and Bart was in the reform tradition of Calvin. Bart himself acknowledged, uh, when, when. People, you know, at the height of the demythologizing controversy, uh, conservative ministers and theologians wanted to put Boltmann on trial for heresy. Bart cautioned them against doing so by saying, those who throw stones at Boltmann better be careful lest they accidentally get Luther. In other words, Bart was sharp enough to realize that Boltmann had taken things that were really to be found in Luther and run much further with them and, and that Boltmann's work couldn't be understood apart from his Lutheran background. And, and I, 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 I think that's why going back to Luther and Calvin and this debate between them and showing that ultimately the debate between Bart and Boltmann on the interpretation of scripture is just round two. Of you know, uh, the first match that happened in the 16th century. And, and, and the reason, the reason this is so important to point out is that the stakes are so much higher in the modern world than they were in the 16th century. Luther didn't know anything about modern historical criticism, of the Bible, uh, but we do. A and not only that, we live in a culture after the enlightenment that of the 18th century that in many ways has departed dramatically from the assumed Christian culture of the middle ages. And, uh, you know, whether you think of science, politics, ethics, we live in a different, we, we live in a very different world than Luther and Calvin for granted. And, and 
what what we see now in our culture is a divide, and I'm thinking specifically of American culture, though it's not just American culture. But you you, you see people who are reacting against modernity, you know, uh, and claiming the Bible in defense of their uh, rejection of modernity. You know, whether you see it in terms of uh, their approaches to science, whether you see it in their rejection of religious liberty, uh, they want to believe this country was founded on biblical principles, which is completely historically fallacious. Uh, you know, they, they, they want to deny women uh, their equality. They, they don't want to deny gay people equality, uh, you know, pain, you know, and, and then the people who, who are, are on the other side of those issues, the people who want to, are defenders of modernity, right? Uh, find themselves forced to reject the Bible of Christianity because it's the those who reject modern culture in the name of, of fidelity to the Bible who who own uh, the label Christian now. You know, so so what I see is at stake here is that you know the only way to I identify yourself as as being a Christian in in any way that could possibly carry weight or have integrity with with people who who are on the side of what I consider to be the legitimate uh, gains of modernity. Y you know, you can only have an approach to the Bible like that of Boltmann uh, that goes back to the kind of approach exemplified by Luther. You know, if, if yeah. I hadn't, you know, like Reinhold Niebuhr once said, you know, uh, when I read some of these religious people, I'm just tempted to run straight into the arms of all the anti-Christian secular critics of religion you know i mean there's absolute i mean you know if if what 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 re, the religious right means by christianity is christianity then i have to state unambiguously i am not a christian and will never be one you know uh, i i don't think i don't think a choice like that has to be made which is the whole point of the liberal protestant endeavor and in this sense what one is a liberal right he he you know, his whole, the whole purpose of the demythologizing controversy was to make it clear that people don't have to have a first century worldview in order to believe the gospel. You know, I, I agree yeah. with him, you know. Maybe you can say a bit more about the Boltmann and what he meant by demythologizing, because a lot of times the only contact point people have with it is in a criticism. They tend to experience the phrase one without knowing what a, what myth means in religious studies to begin with, and then realize that for him, that the energy behind it is it's actually about understanding what faithful proclamation of the gospel looks like in the present. Um, right. And if he had just said, if he had just said, uh, oh, I have a new theological project and it, and it's called uh, missiology to the moderns, then right, people would right. be like, well, praise the Lord. Thank sure. you, Rudolph. And that, that's, uh, that's David Congdon's interpretation. Yeah. Of uh, demythologizing is a term that Boltmont actually, I'm not going to say he regretted using it, but he had second thoughts about whether the term was too, in, had proven to be too inflammatory. And that he, he should have found some substitute. I, I, I think that that is probably right. It, 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 it was, uh, but, but what he means by it, it is just that it, it's a negative form of, of what he means positively by existentialist interpretation of the Bible. Boltmann believes that the Bible is chiefly concerned with answering what he calls the existential question about the meaning and purpose of human existence. Or another way of putting that is, is salvation. So when a young man turns to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? He's asked the existential question. Salvation here being understood as how can I live or what can I do what must I believe about, whatever you want to say, uh, in order not to miss my authentic light as a human being. 
I believe that that is the question that is answered by all the so-called religions, whatever other assumptions they may make about things they want their people to believe and do. So an existentialist interpretation of the Bible is an interpretation that's guided by the existential question the biblical writers are themselves seeking to answer. And, and when you look at it that way, then you realize that in seeking to answer the existential question, the biblical writers also inherited a lot of assumptions from their ancient culture about the way the world works that we today don't share anymore. You know, whether it's that the world was made in six days or that the sun stood still long enough for Joshua to win a battle, um, you know, which presupposes a geocentric understanding of the world, you know, that women are uh, subordinate to men. I mean, there, there's a historical study of the Bible has shown us all the ways that the Bible is an ancient book that reflects the assumptions and practices of ancient people. And Olpon's method, whether you call it negatively depathologizing or positively existentialist is a way of disentangling what he thinks the real importance of the Bible is from those aspects of, of the Bible that are merely reflections of its ancient world. And if you grasp that, then you realize, well, I can, I can believe what Newton or Darwin or Einstein says about how the world works without having to reject the gospel. I can accept the equality of women and uh, believe that there should be no slavery or accept, you know, I mean, whatever you see what I mean, you don't have to sacrifice your intellect. The Episcopal church a few years ago had a great poster making the same point in which, uh, the poster said, Jesus came to save you from your sins, not from your intellect. You know, best ad I've ever seen. Um, yeah, I, I think they should go back to using that ad. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the elements, and I actually think the kind of the positive dimension of of Boltman's framing of the an, an existentialist interpretation, really, like underneath that is his commitment that what we talk about when we talk about the gospel is uh, the most important question about the orientation of your personhood right? for it to that's be an existential. Exist that's, that's what the existential question is. Yeah. And, and so the, it's the, like, there's a, uh, in, in Jesus Christ and mythology, one of my favorite Boltman lines is where he's, he's kind of like getting at how distracted we get by the kinds of questions Christians ask in modernity when they think, much less is up for grabs. So mythology, he says, expresses a certain understanding of human existence. It believes that the world and human life have their ground and their limits and a power, which is beyond all that we can calculate and control. Right. And it's right, that, right. that beyond part for Boltman, uh, where, where it goes down to the, the, the way you orient yourself in the world. And if our obsession with modernity is going yay or nay about things we can try to calculate and figure out about history or doctrines to try to explain and control this, or even the way we relate to nature or the way we relate to institutions and stuff, uh, then we end up uh, in, it, we end up casting pearl before swine in a sense, because we don't realize that the, that the treasure uh, of the faith is something right. that calls, calls right. existence out of you. Um, and, and right and so, so for him i like one of the things that drives me nuts in that i mean later um when he's talking about demythologizing in the present he's not he didn't even sit there and describe scientific theories he's describing like technology that's modern right like oh lights now that changes our relationship to nature and the time and all these other kinds of things uh penicillin like you start going through what he means by modern he's talking about how uh, our contemporary How we context. Actually live. Yeah. And so he's like, right. what is, what does the gospel do to the modern subject when it is seized 
uh, what is seized and brought into the divine life. What does that mean? And then if after that you're like, but man, um, we've been doing the quest for the historical Jesus and would like to discuss this one line with you. He's like, that's fine. I'm not against it. I'm just, what are we doing? And I think that that positive side of that existential energy is is so important. And when we don't own it, I think as liberal Protestants, then we feel like we have to turn our brain off, uh, be vague and dodgy about our uh, kind of public engagement. Or we avoid using language of the tradition that's around gospel stuff uh, because we're uncomfortable to be doing what he's describing, right? To that the that the proclaimer is responding to the text in the tradition uh, on behalf with and before the arrival of the gospel or the coming of God or the like the event of the of the Christ. I mean, it's all these levels right. to it, right? But it's a uh, it, it's so different than thinking of theology as like uh, coming to objectify whatever ideas you can have about God and hold them. And that, that, that all of our thinking comes after being seized by caught up into uh, oriented because of uh, like the so event. Let, let's go back. Let's go back to that original experience I had at summer camp when I was 13 years old. Let's say that in, in when I told the minister, I didn't believe everything in the Bible. He, he had said to me, uh, instead of what he did say, he had said to me, uh, well, if you don't believe everything in the Bible, you're going to hell. And then I would have had to choose, well, do I let my fear of hell scare me into believing something I, I don't honestly believe? I mean, which would be, I mean, sometimes people can do that sort of thing, you know, uh, but it's, it's not, you know, you can, you can deceive yourself into believing something you really don't believe, you know, uh, or do, do you just say, okay, well, I, I, Christianity has nothing for me. In which case then, which, which is how I would have, you know, answered the question. I wasn't going to, you know, become some fundamentalist Christian. I had already been, I already made that decision, uh, before I met that minister at summer camp, but then Christianity would have had no relevance to me whatsoever. And yet if Boltman is right, and I believe he is as a human being, I was still asked the existential question, especially at that age. What is the meaning and purpose of my life? Uh, and I never would have heard what the message of the New Testament is, that the meaning of my life is to love God above all things and to love other human beings just as much as I care about myself. That's what it means to be an authentic human being. I, I don't, I mean, maybe I would have found, you know, maybe I would have run away with the Hare Krishnas, which is something I thought of doing. What's the thing? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I don't really know what they would say is the meaning of life, but you know, I'm just using this. I, mean, I could have been uh, captivated by some other religion, or probably I would have been captivated by uh, some form of secularism, in which case I would have assumed, even if I had never said to myself consciously, uh, the meaning of life is to become as wealthy as possible so I can enjoy as much pleasure as possible. Until I'm dead, since there's no ultimate meaning and purpose in, in life, right? I mean, I think that's what my brothers believe, you know, that, that, that there's no rhyme or reason to being here. And therefore, so long as we don't break the law, hey, you know, we could pr pursue our own selfish good and uh, not really get back, uh, you know, really care about other people except those that are part of our own immediate circle on who we depend right and mm -hmm. that's why we have to care for them because uh, we need them for our happiness you know so so i mean what's at stake is nothing less than the christian answer to the existential question and this is not just ultimately about the bible it's about uh the integrity of christianity itself it, and in underneath that it seems that maybe one of the invitations boltman and luther are making is to recognize that faith does not come with a singular worldview for all time. It does. Faith is not a worldview for Bolton. He insists on that. And I think that's so important. You know, it doesn't matter. Including whether the modern age. one. It's, he's not, he's not, I mean, Bolton doesn't, a lot of people think that Bolton is, is captive to the modern worldview in a way that, that, uh, well, I mean, as a, as a modern person, of course, he, shares the world, the modern worldview. And as we all do, though, that's a big, you know, thing. I mean, there's plenty of differences within 
you know, many ways to spin what it means to be a modern person. I mean, basically Boltmann accepted modern science, history, and, and politics and ethics, uh, you know, in the same way you and I do, Trent. I, I mean, uh, but I mean, you know, Boltmann didn't think the modern worldview was absolute, you know, he, he knew that 500 years from now, people might see things, probably would see things very differently than people did in the mid 20th century in Germany. You know, he wasn't troubled by that. Christian faith is not a worldview. And, and you so often hear conservative Christians speak up the Christian worldview, which involves all these, you know, items. Uh, from science to gender, to sexuality, to, uh, endorsement of the capitalist economy and, and, uh, doctrines, and, no Christian held the first 1600 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's a laundry list of, uh, you know, and that, and that's, that, you know, and, and they, they can justify it, or they believe they can justify all this by part appealing to particular items or verses in the Bible for, for all these things, you know, and, and Boltman would say, this is completely beside the point. You know, you, you're, you're completely missing. You know, I, I'll never forget when Trump ran the last time I, I had this conversation with a, a fundamentalist evangelical Christian who, uh, was not only trying to get me to vote for Trump, but also trying to to get me to convince my, my congregation that as Christians, they had to vote for Trump too. And it, you know, it was just so amazing to me as I listened to her. I mean, not only did I disagree with her politically, but you know, I, I mean, all the things that she thinks are essential to Christianity have no place in my understanding of, of the gospel. I, I'm not trying to be uncharitable, but, but. I really wouldn't say that her position is what I mean by Christian faith. And, and, and yet, I mean, people, you know, would laugh at me to say that because there's more so-called Christians in this country like her than there are like me. Right. But, but I mean, I, I really mean it. I mean, her faith is not the face of faith of Luther and it, it's not, it's not the, my faith either, you know? So, I mean, I, I, I think things are really at stake here. And, and my great fear is that, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think my, my book is going to be taken with much seriousness by mainline Protestants. I mean, they're, they're interested in other things. This seems too far from, you know, it's too historical to his theological. I mean, it, you know, I, I talked for 26 years at a left of center theological seminary in Minnesota and the vast majority of, of students studying for the ministry couldn't be bothered by, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in the book, I, I, I cite this, uh, recently or not recently, in the last few years, I, I, I met a, a fellow United Methodist minister who's obviously liberal or progressive. I think she calls herself progressive. Uh, you know, and she was all in favor of changing the United Methodist Church's stance on gay people as was I, of course. But, but she said, Hey, Luther was a fundamentalist. And with that statement, she was wiping his, her hands clean of him once and for all. And, and I mean, the fact that you can hear ministers who have been to seminary say something like Martin Luther was a fundamentalist and therefore he has no First Protestant has, I have no use for him whatsoever. That is not an exception to the rule in, in terms of what I have experienced in mainline Protestant education, uh, the last 35 years or so. There's such a, a lack of concern with knowing our, our traditions and, and uh, seeing uh, the, it, it's what Bonhoeffer meant by, by Protestantism without reformation. I mean, she doesn't know the first thing about her product, even though she's an ordained minister in a mainline Protestant denomination. I agree with her on the sexual orientation issue, of course, but you, you know, Luther's the kind of person you can, you can appeal to 
for your, your critical approach to the Bible. I mean, why would you want to shoot yourself in the foot like that? And yet, so, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I think that, that people like me and you are, are going to be, or find ourselves increasingly in the major minority and the, and the majority are, are going to, I think we're coming to a place where the choice is going to be, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I, I think it's going to come to the, the, uh, place where, you know, if you're a progressive and, and, you know, you believe in human rights, freedom of religion, modern science, modern ethics, you're, you're concerned about social justice and ecological integrity, et, et cetera, et cetera, the rights of gay people and trans people, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, ha you're gonna have to reject Christianity because Christianity has become so reactionary that that's what you're up against. I mean, what do you think about? I mean, what for? Do you, maybe, uh, maybe I'm overreacting, but please, if you I, have a oh, vote, vote, no, please tell me. I mean, I, I, I think that, I mean, what the waxing and waning of it will look like is one thing, but I, then how to play out timing wise, I'm, I'm not real sure. But I do think the number of people who are simultaneously distrustful and find kind of the institutions of religious traditions problematic, where there, there's a growing number of people exist in that space, often for real ethical reasons, and uh, lack community context and a wisdom tradition for wrestling with the deepest existential questions. Uh, and in that space, that in whatever way it, you know, uh, shows back up, I think a vision of the faith that that doesn't think the gospel correlates to one particular worldview. And in order to be in the grace of God, you not only have to digest and hold that worldview, uh, but then protect it and enforce it in a cultural space. and. What, what I loved about the book, what I resonated with in this kind of line of, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, Paul into Luther, into Boltmann, uh, into the present is, uh, it, it, that vision has, is a way of being deeply Christian and going, yes, Christianity has often thought its truth was justified by a worldview that's deeply Eurocentric shaped and honed and with to form imperial power and then uh it has been exported from europe into america it has been transformed uh and and dialed up uh because of our uh extractive economic and ecological patterns uh it has uh increased alienation as uh our commitment um to that constant acceleration and drive of modernity it's increased alienation between us and neighbor, our enemies, our non-human neighbors. And so that those existential questions keep burning. And uh, the, the idea that the, that the task of the proclaimer and the task of the Christian uh, is to articulate the gospel and not impose or uh, demand allegiance to a worldview, to me, that's, that's exciting. Um, and it has something to say because so often in a, in a, in our contemporary culture, the way spiritual questions of meaning, um, religious yearnings and things get expressed are the way desires get expressed in the market as, as, uh, things that you need to go do, uh, habits and patterns you have to form, like insert all the essentially works righteousness, uh, for the, 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 uh, kind of post-religious soul. Um, and in that context, someone, or really not a person, but a community uh, that, that gathers because uh, it knows it finds life precisely by being addressed and challenged by a deep and radical affirmation from the one that knows you in, in your fully and embraces you in your brokenness. That is a kind of intervention to the kind of spiritual deficit disorder that is increasingly growing. Right? So there's like all the spiritual deficit disorder type elements that are just connected to our transformation of modern selfhood, technology, pace of life, all that kind of stuff. And then the reservoir, the communities that are embodying wisdom traditions 
are, are becoming, uh, they're the ones making demands for cultural commuting, right? To come adopt a worldview, to ever belong, to do all this. Uh, and so to me, the, the context at which uh, the, this trajectory of the, the, you know, the gospel coming before tradition and tradition is what comes out of uh, the, the ever reforming exposure to the Bolton uh, reality of Protestantism. Like that's, that is going to be a possibility what it looks like and how and stuff. I don't know. Um, I share your hope. I've been, I've been passionately committed to it all my, all my adult life and I'll, I'll be committed to it until the day I die. And I, I just hope that we can spread that message more effectively in our culture. I mean, like I, I'm, I'm preaching what I think are among the finest sermons being preached in, in Orange County. And, you know, I, 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 I can't get people interested in my church. You know, I mean, it, it's the people I think who really need to hear what I'm saying, uh, aren't are going to darken the door of a church anymore, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I and and what the you know this is one of those places in the later Bonhoeffer where this kind of radical Lutheran, a radical Protestant initiative you see where he's like, well, what is a religionless Christianity? It's one without the trappings of modernity, without the vocation of subservience to state, culture, nation. Uh, it's one where maybe we don't own property, maybe. You know, like he's he's like all these things that we thought are the right. givens of religion in the modern right. world. Right. Uh, what happens after that? And in his suggestions and the letters are the arcane disciplines and a community that recognizes the face of the other as the coming of Christ. That, Prayer and doing a good job, baiting and tun des and praying and and doing what is right. Doing that is different than succeeding at the institutional expression of faith that, you know, it, that it's, that it was formed for a different time period. Right. And, and I think that the, the, in the same way that Luther's kind of like gospel centered tenacity, uh, kept the reformation open the, in, in both our, in theological reflection so that it gets kind of continuously picked up. Uh, we could have talked about how Schleiermacher does it and all these other figures. I think that that mainline traditions and more liberal Christians, they've kind of atrophied the muscle of institutional form as as being as open. That could be. That could be. Yeah. You know, the the other element is Protestantism, it, it develops in a text-based space and centers around a certain way of preaching in relationship to the text uh, that I wonder if its day is gone or, or, or that what it looks like to be addressed by the text is performed differently or enacted differently. I don't, I don't know because it's not, there are more people that listen to long, like Ted talks or long podcasts or stand up comedy. So it's not like the spoken word. People listen to more spoken word pr now uh, than before. Um, but it's in the way it happens is different. There's been a lot of recent research on the kind of like efficacy, both in like biometric ways and um, frequency and self-report studies of the shift to online stuff. And the, there is like generational cohort distinctions in that people that are more digital native have like on higher, more response rate to it. But the gap even for digital na natives when it goes to does participation with digital mediation in a religious community uh, generate the same kind of well-being features, identity support, all those kind of things? It doesn't. It doesn't work as well. And so, the the at a time where the incentive structure for our our economics and for selves who don't know what to do with difference between the other uh, is to retreat to more mediation, distance, and isolation. It, they I could see the the kind of awkward intimacy that takes place in confessing your sin with 40 people that live in your neighborhood uh, to be a deeply transgressive act uh, that is uh, more human than what happens so often. And that's a different kind of like, I think there's a different kind of orientation towards the moment. 
the natural tendency for Protestantism in America, I think, has been let's do what dominant culture does and then do it to the glory of God with excellence, right? And that's one thing. But now, like, you're not just now that take spoken word. You were competing with everyone. It, it, they have access to the, the the best teacher of everything, like this kind of thing. But it, but that's only one element of Christian community, and it's not the one uh, that moves the gospel into that existential register, right? The proclamation of the gospel was, uh, and, and the, and the spoken word was always a part of a community that comes, uh, to be, right, right. to encounter the gospel. Uh, I mean, like even that, I mean, B- Boltman has, uh, that bit about where he's talking about the word of God and, and says, yeah, the Bible is of course, a bunch of human words, uh, but it becomes the word of God. Uh, when it's right. received right. in faith by the community. Right. 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 And and it is not surprising that the scripture becomes the word of God when you're in a community of image bearers around you and not, you know, isolated by yourself. So I don't know. I I tend to be optimistic, Paul. And so I just, I'm glad I like to I'm talk glad. myself up. That's why I like that's why I can have a friend like you to keep me on the uh, bright side. And I agree, you have excellent sermons. I think uh, uh, I love preaching. I love uh, and I do I do what you know Bart and Boltman uh were calling us to do, you know, uh treat the text as something more than a mere historical artifact from the ancient world and, and make it come alive every Sunday. I put my heart and soul into and as well as all of my mind into my sermons. I write them out and I I mean I really just you know, it's it's a wonderful. Uh, I, I find it so stimulating and challenging in the best sense of the word. Yeah. Trip, thank you so much for uh, this conversation. Oh, um, I love. Let's have to another talk to one you. really soon. I look forward to your uh, series on Bone All righty. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a great to see. I really appreciate your interest in my book. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, Paul. Bye, Trip. Hey, you made it all the way through the episode. Congratulations. If you would like to help make this possible, I would absolutely love for you to head over to homebrewcommunity.com. There, you'll be able to join the Substack community, process this, where you get ad-free versions of all the new episodes when they come out. You'll be able to get invites to live engagement, Zoom hangouts and such. And um, it's, it's a real easy way to make, help make this happen. Or or you could join theologyclass.com. Uh, that is a place where you get access to the 45 plus online classes we've done and we keep adding to it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, there are lots of ways to support the podcast, get access to extra content and interaction. And I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate all of you who've helped make this part. So head over homebrewcommunity.com and uh, share the brew. Smoochie boochies, friends. <laughs>